Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back, we are at module 6 and we are looking at the neural substrates of various linguistic functions. We started with the brain structure and the various uh, functional domains of uh, the brain with respect to language and then we went on to talk about the various kinds of aphasia. Aphasias are langu language disorders which typically result out of some kind of a um, injury or stroke to the brain. Typically, they will have um, a lesion in some of the ling one of the linguistic uh, one of the areas that are responsible for linguistic functions. So, we looked at uh, how Broca's aphasia um, is. So, Broca's aphasia has certain uh, features like this is a labored speech and typically it will be a non-fluent, um, uh, uh, this is called non-fluent aphasia, it is, uh, it is marked by this kind of a labored um, utterance. So, this is uh, one of the most commonly utilized uh, uh, test battery and this is the Boston Diagnostic Aphasia Examination uh, picture. So, this is the cookie theft uh, uh, story that the, uh, that, that the person that the aphasic patient was um, describing in this case. And then we now go on to the Wernicke's aphasia. This is yet another very um, um, most studied type of aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia and this is one example that we have already seen. So, Wernicke's aphasia as opposed to Broca's aphasia is a fluent aphasia which means that the production of language is not affected rather it is often marked as a very hyperfluent aphasia. Patients are hyperfluent very often, of course fluent, but sometimes hyperfluent because they have a speech rate which is higher than the normal. However, the major problem with uh, Wernicke's aphasia is comprehension because comprehension is severely affected, severely impaired in this kind of aphasia. And in some severe cases, patients understand almost nothing that is spoken to them. As far as repetition is concerned, it is also abnormal. So, we will look at the clinical features of various aphasias through production, comprehension, repetition of words and sentences and of course, the lesion site. And then the, as far as the lesion correlate is concerned, in this case, in case of uh, Wernicke's aphasia, posterior third of left superior temporal gyrus is the one that is found to be most affected along with the left middle temporal gyrus. However, this is not universal, some uh, many patients have shown a variety of different uh, slightly different domains. Sometimes some patients have also exhibited lesion extending up to the left inferior parietal lobule as well. So, there are there are some areas which are typically found to be affected, the brain typically uh, um, the lesion sites will typically occur in the um, in most cases in, ca in uh, left superior temporal gyrus, but this is not universal. Some patients do show some um, extended damage as well. Then we have conduction aphasia. This is um, somewhere in between Broca's and Wernicke's aphasia in terms of fluency. So, this the patients of conduction aphasia will have be more fluent than Broca's aphasics, but less fluent than the Wernicke's aphasics. In terms of comprehension, it is generally well preserved except when the patient is faced with grammatically complex structures. Simple structures they are able to comprehend perfectly. 
repetition is also impaired in ca uh, in these patients in most severe cases um, uh, it is found in case of uh, sentences but visible at word level also so sentence level complex sentences are difficult to repeat but at word level they are they have less trouble however it can be seen at word level as well in terms of lesion this type of aphasia is traditionally thought to arise due to a disconnection between the brokers and the wernicke's area so basically uh, this the connection is disrupted however many aphasics also show some damage uh, so some more damage than the subcortical white uh, many aphasics also show more damage than the subcortical white matter area which is the uh, which is the pathway sometimes extending to the sylvian fissure as well so this is not only affecting the subcortical white matter that connects the uh, brokers and wernicke's area but also extends to other regions the fourth type of aphasia that we will be looking at now is global aphasia this is as the name suggests this is the most severe kind of aphasia most uh, devastating type of aphasia and it is um, also the most easy to describe because this is an aphasia where almost all language functions are uh, disrupted all kinds of communication is compromised so spoken language production is extremely limited often restricted to some typical utterances like yes no da and so on so basically what they do is because the, um, the production repertoire is so so restricted they kind of make some prosodic changes to the to those same words and try to use it for various purposes comprehension is also severely damaged and lesion correlate um, typically generally will uh, will show entire left perisylvanian uh, perisylvian cortex and the underlying white matter so it is a rather broad area that gets affected and as a result of which we see that the global aphasics have severe difficulty in comprehension repetition and every uh, production etc so this is a uh, sort of a comparison across the ta four types and you can see the um, on, on various kinds of tasks like fluency comprehension and repetition and their neural correlates. There is also yet another kind of um, uh, syndrome that is related to language um, that, that also affects language function in, uh, in people which is called Tourette syndrome. Tourette syndrome is a syndrome that this is a nervous system disorder which also affects language. So, this produces this syndrome produces random and involuntary reflexes which are called tics. So, those tics sometimes may also involve you know uttering involuntarily uttering some sounds some um, some kind of a you know verbal utterance which has uh, and it is uncontrollable it goes on for some time it is like a it is like an impulse it is a random um, um, reflex sort of an outcome. So, in this type of disorder which also affects language use quite often is caused by a dysfunction of the subcortex. So, that is the neural correlate of Tourette syndrome. Now, aphasia research though it has largely been dependent upon data from monolinguals. However, there have also been some investigations uh, on in of the same problem in case of bilinguals and polyglots as well. So, for over a hundred years researchers have tried to uh, look at how aphasia may affect bilinguals. Does uh, aphasia uh, whatever kind of aphasia does it affect a bilinguals two languages differently that is the question that has been asked and there have been uh, different kinds of publications different kinds of findings that have been um, that have been put forward that we have data for. For a long time there was a, a belief in fact uh, the data suggested that the languages will be affected similarly on the one hand that was that was the finding that languages will be um, both languages of a bilingual will be affected uh, more or less similarly. But on the other hand there is also a large amount of data that suggests that bilinguals two languages are affected differently. So, the there is no uh, there is the, the the picture is not very clear. However, so we know that there is a lot of cases there are a lot of um, uh, findings that show that there is a degree of uh, com comparable degree of impairment in both languages. However, since there are also cases that have been reported where two languages are not affected similarly, we will uh, that we will look at the kind of aphasia kind of um, 
uh, different patterns that emerge from that kind of an empirical evidence. So, these patterns, these different patterns when the bilingual two languages are not affected similarly were studied and listed by para Michael Paradis in these two publications and many other uh, subsequent publications. So, there are uh, about six types of differences, different patterns of bilingual aphasia that um, he lists. One of them is the first is called selective aphasia. Selective aphasia as the name suggests that patients only one language is impaired, the other language is spared. Then we have differential aphasia where the languages uh, bilinguals two languages show different patterns of impairment. So, in one language may be it is comprehension in another it can be production or repetition or so on. So, there is, there is a differential status of the two languages in terms of how it gets affected. Then we have successive aphasia this is the third type where one language shows signs of impairment following another. So, one language gets affected first then the other language. Then the fourth type is called antagonistic. Antagonistic is when the recovery of one language means you know um, uh, as it progresses it is inversely proportionate to the recovery of the other language. So, as one language progresses the other language regresses the, re the uh, recovery of the languages. Alternative antagonism is availability that shifts between language sometimes one language sometimes another language. And then there is uh, the sixth type that he also lists is blending or mixing. This is, a, this is a strange case where properties of multiple languages are mixed. So, uh, one thing from one language gets uh, attached to another uh, property of another language. So, one language spoken with the accent of another let us say uh, English spoken with, uh, with French accent or inflection of one language getting, um, getting merged with the root of another language and so on. So, these are the six uh, types. So, when there are these differences how, how do you um, how, how do we uh, explain the differences in terms of the uh, languages being either affected or there is a difference in the way they are recovered. There have been a few theories the first one uh, one of the most um, cited reasons is called the rule of ribbon. This is actually dependent on the theory of retrograde amnesia which was uh, which is suggested in 1881. It says that the memories when you, when amnesia is affecting a person a, a patient of amnesia will uh, show a particular pattern. So, what is the pattern? The earlier memories or skills that are learnt earlier in life are more likely to remain intact and the memories that are collected later will be affected more when a person suffers from amnesia. So, be dependent on this theory uh, in, uh, incorporating this theory in bilingual aphasia says that the language that is learned first will remain intact, the language that is learned second will be more affected by aphasia, meaning that the second language is more likely to be affected. Then we have Pitre's rule which says that it is not when the language was learned, but how well it was used focusing on the using, uh, usage pattern of the language rather than the chronological factor. Third, third uh, standpoint in this is that the more importance uh, a language has in terms of the emotional significance. So, what is the language that uh, you know uh, you have which has more emotional significance for people. Uh, there was um, nowadays it is no more uh, we do not anymore use the word mother tongue and other tongue and so on and so forth. We use a very objective terminology first language second language, but earlier the word mother tongue was commonly utilized and one of the aspects of uh, one of the important aspects of mother tongue was that it is the language of emotion. This is the language in which you express your emotions best, this is the language in which you uh, dream and so on. So, this is kind of a similar standpoint that is taken here that the language that has higher emotional significance will be more uh, intact. And of course, and, and then uh, comes the uh, the standpoint given by Luria, which says who says that it is impairment will depend entirely upon the area of the brain that has been affected, and whether the language has been learned, uh, you know, the mode of learning the language, mode of acquiring the language. So, has it been, you know, uh, whether the language was primarily spoken or primarily written. So, basically, if you have learn the language in the social uh, scenario that means the it has been picked up by mostly in the by the auditory loop 
but if you have been formally taught the language it, it, it is most more often than not it will be um, primarily written form that you have been that the person patient has been exposed to. So, as a result if the visual cortex gets affected you know, that language will be. So, whichever language is dependent on whichever mode of acquisition it will have similar it will show a pattern of um, impairment in that way depending on the brain area which was utilized for acquiring that language. These are the four uh, standpoints in terms and uh, which tries to which try to uh, explain the differential pattern of bilingual aphasia and the way it affects bilinguals two different languages. However, the problem is that there is since the data is so varied and each patient is different, each patient has its has his own unique uh, uh, language record as well as own unique um, disorder with respect to the lesion sites and so on and so forth. So, it is very difficult to come to a conclusion and consensus as to uh, that that is only one pattern, there are actually many patterns to it. So, uh, that is why the problem uh, that is a problem and we have to uh, kind of um, uh, leave it at that, that we do not have the final answer. Another problem with respect to this the findings is that often uh, for a long time uh, often the patients two languages were not assessed properly. The tools, the, the diagnostic tools were not developed until very recently. A diagnostic tools that objectively assess the bilinguals. Um, proficiency in both the languages, proficiency at various levels. So, which these this test batteries became um, available only recently as you can see bilingual aphasiasis uh, test by Paradis 1987 which is quite recent. So, and now of course, using these uh, tools we have a better um, uh, we have a better scenario to collect objective data and uh, the field is still developing. However, we know that there are um, every kind of aphasia has a neural substrate. There is yet another kind of uh, aphasia which is not caused by uh, an injury to the brain, but by neurodegenerative diseases. Neurodegenerative diseases most uh, more often occurs in the uh, old age. We all know that uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and so on affect people of an advanced age and this is when neurodegeneration takes place and this is where a different kind of aphasia also is visible which is called primary progressive aphasia because it gradually progresses starting from depending on how the neural degeneration is taking place gradually language will get affected more and more. So, um, in a host of uh, related neurodegenerative diseases, the degenerating language ability is the most salient feature and the principal cause of restrictions in daily life, which is what we often see in um, patients in advanced age. So, this, uh, this the study of primary progressive aphasia goes back uh, in time when the um, neurologists discovered that some patients had linguistic disabilities, language disorders which co-occurred with various other um, problems, other kinds of um, gradually advancing cognitive disorders. Sometimes social cognition is, uh, uh, is, 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 is missing. So, there was a particular case where a person was um, having serious social conduct problem along with language getting affected. So, at one time he actually threatened his wife with a knife, but one this kind of one of incidents that co occurred then there are many other cases as well. Uh, in the another case a woman with slow deterioration, deterioration of word comprehension was also found. So, gradually this kind of um, findings built up and then we come to uh, a better understanding of various kinds of aphasia that are part of neurodegenerative diseases. So, these are there are typically there are three types progressive non-fluent, semantic dementia and logopenic progressive aphasia. Each of these is defined in terms of characteristic cluster of linguistic deficits and a distinctive distribution of cortical atrophy. Atrophy refers to the thinning of cortical areas, basically brain cells die off and those cells are degenerated and as a result of which those cortical areas become thinner and the functions associated with that particular cortical domain gets affected which also includes language. So, progressive non-fluent aphasia this is a case where typically the uh, patients will show degradation of morphology and syntax 
in the early stages of this disease other cognitive functions uh, like core cognitive functions remain intact, but with gradually uh, with, with time uh, deficits involving working memory and executive functions as well as complex visual tasks are found to be affected. So, what is the neural correlate of this? What is the neural substrate that is responsible for this left posterior inferior frontal gyrus roughly which translates to Broca's area. In fact, because this is Broca's area is affected that is why we see non fluent aphasia remember non fluent aphasia is also called Broca's aphasia. So, when Broca's area gets affected when neurodegeneration affects Broca's area we not only have various kinds of um, core cognitive functions getting affected, but also a kind of a um, aphasia that is called uh, primary uh, that is called um, progressive non fluent aphasia. Then you have semantic dementia, this is a degradation of as the name suggests semantic and conceptual knowledge, grammatical and phonological knowledge is largely spared. So, what is affected is the semantics the comprehension part the conceptual part of it. Also it has poor object recognition abnormal social cognition and emotion regulation. Emotion regulation as in the patient will have inappropriate emotional uh, reactions to in various situations. This again the neural substrate will be anterior temporal lobes typically bilaterally meaning both the hemispheres get affected, but of course, the uh, severity is higher in the left hemisphere. Then we have logopenic progressive aphasia, this is a degradation of word retrieval and auditory verbal short term memory. Then they also have they also co occur often with Alzheimer's disease they, uh, and then there are calculation difficulties also. This is again um, the found in the, in the with the with the co occurring with the degradation of the Wernicke's area. Now, let us go on to see the what about the other uh, normal language processing normal language processing speech processing how we find the neural substrates of this. As we have said before that aphasia uh, the data from aphasia research has been the earliest uh, source of information source of all the uh, neuro neuroscience scientific um, uh, results neuroscientific data for understanding the neural substrate of language functions. However, the we also have adequate data today to talk about uh, language functions in normal human beings human um, uh, brains. So, starting with language uh, speech perception we see how speech perception actually goes through various stages starting with the inner ear and then going to the auditory cortex there are it is a complex process and it is a, um, a multi layered process, but we will uh, look at the major points that are part of that processing here. So, it goes from undergoes many transformation before it reaches the cerebral cortex. So, basically the physical aspects of sound are uh, given uh, are uh, received or are uh, you know given input through the auditory system and then they are basically encoded as electrical signals in the spinal ganglion. So, this is uh, this is the first important uh, location where the uh, input is taken and as electrical signals uh, which is uh, reside which resides in the cochlea in the inner ear. Now, this wave of sounds that have been now uh, give taken in through the inner through the ears they this in the form of electrical signals they will move through thousands in fact, 16000 sensory receptors which are called the hair cells. This the, the, the wave travels through the hair cells and then it goes via uh, it goes through a long uh, winding way. So, these cells are topographically arrayed along the length of the spinal ganglion. Now, there is a very a very fine and very nuanced uh, arrangement of those cells as, as they carry the information to the to the cortical regions. So, the cells towards the base are sensitive to low frequency and the cells at the apex level top level are sensitive to high frequency sounds. So, that is how the cells the hair cells are organized in the spinal ganglion and neural signals are then propagated along the nerve to brain stem through three levels of nuclei. And then from there of course, there are three levels and then it goes to the auditory cortex to be processed for uh, to be further processed. So, this is a roughly uh, um, the map uh, showing how it actually happens 
Now, the most important thing about um, uh, one of the most important things about speech perception is that it is the early stages at least are have two important features. One is that it is bilaterally organized, another feature is that it is hierarchical. We are talking about the early stages that is when the the speech signal is received and it's, it travels from the inner ear to the um, auditory cortex. So, two features of bilaterality and hierarchical uh, arrangement are this is, is what we will talk about. So, bilaterally organized means that it is uh, found in both the hemispheres. It is not only one only left hemisphere that works, we receive signals from both the ears. So, it is bilaterally organized and then this uh, the signals uh, travels through the hair cells to the to the um, uh, cortical region that is responsible for processing. So, it happens on both sides though left hemisphere has slightly um, slight high, slightly higher um, advantage. This is why we also we see that there is a uh, right visual field and right uh, auditory field advantage in case of bilaterality uh, laterality in brain functions. And then there is higher and the process is also hierarchical. Hierarchical there are stages. In the first stage the dorsal STG that is superior temporal gyrus processes the elementary properties of speech sounds. And then in the later stage lateral superior temporal gyrus and middle superior temporal sulcus will be processing the complex language specific phonological properties. So, there is there is a hierarchy of function depending on what the process is and where it is um, processed. So, there are different areas responsible for different functions and different processes in that pathway. So, uh, it has electrophysiological studies have shown that this uh, the this ascending pathway preserves with exquisite fidelity the elementary acoustic features of human soundscapes. Human ears can do what till now the most AI systems have not been able to do. We are capable of understanding very fine nuances within the soundscape and that is because the pathway maintains with utmost fidelity all the signatures that are responsible for those subtle differences, subtle nuances. The ascending pathway is parallel by also a descending pathway all the way to the spinal ganglion thereby allowing cognitive states like selective attention. So, processes most of the processes whether it is visual or it is auditory or process there is a two way traffic one is the bottom up uh, processing which is dependent on the stimulus. So, as we hear the sounds the ear picks up and then takes it in you know the uh, uh, signals that are received are uh, they travel to the cortical region and gets processed. At the same time there is also a top down process that happens top down process from the brain to the um, to the uh, receptive uh, organs sensory organs and these are motivated by the attentional mechanism and so on. So, this is the descending pathway that we are talking about and they allow things like selective attention and to modulate ad early auditory perception because a person who is listening is also attending to the source of the sound and so on. So, there is an ascending pathway and there is a descending pathway. Ascending pathway takes the signal to the brain and the descending pathway takes our uh, is, re is, is responsible for modulating cognitive other cognitive functions like attention. In terms of speech perception there is also an interesting um, uh, interesting finding that needs to be mentioned here which is the McGurk effect. This is an interesting um, an interesting illusion that the, that demonstrates that during face to face speech perception the brain automatically fuses simultaneous signals at the same time. So, we do not when we when we are listening to somebody face to face we not only pick up the signal from the auditory loop with uh, in the auditory loop, but also the visual uh, loop as well. So, we get signals from both the uh, properties and what the brain does brain does something very interesting it fuses those two signals together and kind of takes a middle path. How do we uh, what is the finding in this uh, regard? The typical experimental setup is like this, the participants will be presented with an auditory recording of a syllable ba. Simultaneously, they will also look at a video recording of a face that is producing the sound the syllable ga and ultimately the subject will end up 
when you ask the subject what did you hear, he will say he or she will say he heard the. So, in the in the in the in the um, in the channel in the airway in the pathway where the articulation takes place, ba is at the end at the at the opening of the mouth that is where it is produced and ga is towards the end in the uh, back of the um, uh, channel. So, what the brain does is it fuses. So, um, this is if this is how our our vocal channel is then ba is produced here, ga is produced here and what the brain ultimately thinks it heard is something like here the. So, some it, it fuses both the signals together and so the brain integrates the two competing sensory inputs and adopts an intermediate position. The brain is a fascinating um, organ, the most fascinating of all organs probably. Now, let us move on to speech production. Speech production is of course, uh, an enormous domain of study. It has uh, generated a lot of empirical data that typically with respect to three kinds of uh, functions, three main domains. It is a very cog complicated cognitive uh, motor skill that includes incorporating that incorporates information from various domains, but largely we can um, uh, we can we can uh, divide we can categorize all the research uh, domains into three typical um, typically three areas sub areas that is lexical representation and processing rep lexical representation in the brain and its uh, processing articulation that is the speaking part and then peripheral motor system. So, one of the most uh, widely accepted and the one of the most famous uh, models for this uh, lexical representation in the human brain was given by William Levelt. 1989 it is called the lemma model and he proposes a six stage um, uh, system through which we actually uh, speech production takes place. So, it starts with the conceptual preparation goes on to grammatical encoding and then it goes on to morphophonological encoding followed by phonetic encoding then comes artic articulation and once articulation happens the speaker is also a hearer the person who is speaking also hears his own articulation. So, the self perception and monitoring and repair happens after that. So, once we have articulated all of us are aware that when we have said something wrong we will immediately correct it. So, that is also part of the loop. So, the moment articulation happens then self perception monitoring and then repair and the same process goes again. This is a simplified version of a, of a rather complex model, uh, but that takes care of the primary, um, uh, primary aspects of it. These this uh, findings the, the, the model has been tested through various neuro imaging studies that take that uh, utilized various kinds of methods like um, uh, linguistic methods. So, there are neurogen neuro imaging studies that make the subjects do any of these or many of these um, uh, many, many of these experimental um, studies. They can be verb generation, noun generation, picture naming, word naming and so on and so forth. So, there is a huge amount of data that is uh, available in the in this research domain that has looked at various kinds of language producing structures. So, if one can be you know one the, they have utilized verb naming versus object naming versus picture naming versus various things and then there is also generating words starting with a particular um, sound and so on this particular uh, sound uh, and so on. So, it can be the sound ba or a ga and then go on. So, that is how and simultaneously there will be a neuroimaging study that will be a part of this paradigm. So, as a result of which as the person produces various kinds of uh, gives a various kinds of linguistic output the brain can be imaged and that is how we have come to the understanding as to how what are the brain what are the neural networks that are responsible for each of these or a combination of these various types of articulation and largely largely they satisfy uh, the lemma model of Le of William Levelt and that is why it is widely accepted. There are of course, controversies, but we are not going there it is largely accepted. So, the results point to so all these uh, various types of studies have uh, pointed to a huge vast network of neural areas in the left lateralized perisylvian network. Also there are functional specialization for 
various processing stages of production within this network. So, there, there is a huge network of neural uh, domains, cortical regions that are responsible for this. However, there are certain domains that are specialized for any of those or many of those uh, functions that we have seen. So, conceptual preparation will be uh, processed in one name domain versus uh, phonetic encoding takes place in another domain and so on and so forth. So, these are the two primary findings that there is a huge network, vast network of neural areas and also there are functional specializations for various um, uh, any of uh, many of these processes. Yet another domain uh, of language, um, uh, language that where which takes us to the neural substrates of language use is the case of specific language impairment. Specific language impairment is uh, the case where deficits in language in happens even though the child is otherwise developing normally. So, basically on the uh, on the surface it is a typical child which has no cognitive other cognitive disorder or any other developmental disorder still the child shows some difficulty in language. So, the difficulties in producing and understanding basically happens as if there is no obvious reason. So, because the child is typically uh, growing this kind of disorder cannot be uh, related to general cognitive impairment, physical abnormality of the speech apparatus like left palate and so on or the developmental disorders like autism spectrum disorder or acquired brain damage or hearing loss nothing. None of these problems are there associated with specific language impairment it, that is why it is called specific language impairment it is a, a problem an impairment specific to language. This also has a neural underpinning. It is found. It is. Um, it is uh, found that the gray matter in Broca's area, which is involved in speech production, it was found increased in case of SLI, speech uh, specific language uh, impairment. But at the same time, even though there is an increased amount of gray matter, it showed decreased amount of activity. So, uh, uh, did not show as much activity during the task. So, though, though the white though the gray matter is increased the activity level was not in the temporal lobe which are important for comprehension of speech and language the gray matter is both reduced and activity is also reduced. So, in case of Broca's area the production area heightened gray matter, but lower activity and in case of uh, in the temporal lobe that is the roughly the Wernicke's area the amount of gray matter is reduced as well as lesser activity level as well. So, SLI also has a strong neural underpinning. Now, let us move on to yet another domain of language processing which is reading and writing. Reading is called the receptive language domain of receptive language processing. There is a very interesting um, uh, uh, travel blogger, travel youtuber who, 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 who records his uh, travels across the world it is called bald and bankrupt. So, there is one in one of his videos he which is called lost in Burma adventures in squiggle town that takes us to a very interesting um, uh, thing that we take for granted in human in modern humans uh, 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 brain capacity which is the capacity to read. So, what does a brain does when we read a reading brain basically changes mere marks or squiggles as uh, bald and beautiful uh, videos to talks about into it processes is into words of a language. So, when he he went to Burma, he went to uh, Burma through India from Manipur or somewhere and then he goes and sees all those uh, notice boards everything written in their language and of course, he does not read. So, he just says squiggle, squiggle, squiggle and more squiggle. So, the languages that we do not read remain squiggles for us, the language that we read becomes words of a language for us. So, that is where the reading brain comes into uh, picture. So, how does it happen? The languages that we know the familiar languages are read and this reading happens through an assembly line of multiple stages of neural representation. It is not a simple process again there is an almost like an assembly line of various processes neural representation and their processes. So, this um, one of the most uh, well known and well accepted model for this process is the LCD model the local combination detector model by Tehan et al. Um, this is uh, this is a representation from his uh, 
famous paper. So, basically um, we are not going to the details of it, but roughly what happens is that reading happens through a lot of processes it goes like this. So, starting with the receptive field and then goes on to LGN that is the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus where the first stage of um, processing does take place and then it goes through various various parts of the uh, of the of the of the cortical regions of v1 v2 uh, 1 2 and 3 and uh, and then it goes on to uh, this is v8 and then it goes to the left OTS occipital temporal sulcus. So, this is the way, this is the pathway through which reading happens and at every level there is a different process that takes place different um, organization of various inputs and so on. So, this is so the retina is the first uh, step uh, to the eyes that we get the signals from input letter strings and then within the brain the first uh, area in LG and the thalamus is where the first processing happens and then it goes on to four stages here itself in the primary visual cortex and then it goes to left OTS again there are two stages um, they are called minus 56 and minus 48 these are the names given and then the finally the processing happens. So, basically there are deep various brain regions various neural um, uh, domains through which the signal goes and gets processed at every level and ultimately we read. So, the recognition finally recognition and understanding the word meaning and everything happens uh, through various stages. Uh, stages. One very important discovery in this domain was that of visual word form area in 2000 it is a very recent uh, comparatively very recent development in 2000 year 2000 by Cohen et al. They found out that there is a particular domain in the brain which is responsible for word form, form uh, for, for forming words. So, visual word form pro gets processed in this area. It has a lot of functions and many uh, research is still going on as to how what are the other uh, processes that take place there, but primarily we have listed some here. What does this area do? It responds to printed words uh, that you that we see it regardless of position to left or right of visual fixation. So, let us say when we are reading something like uh, this, there is the moment I am looking at D, this is the foveal, uh, fixation, foveal area that is the fixation area where my eyes are looking right now. So, this is foveal region, these are parafoveal. So, the side the peripheral area where the um, eyes also see. So, we do not when I am seeing D, I can also simultaneously see A and, and G. So, these are parafo these are regions of parafoveal uh, uh, visual areas and this is the foveal. So, this is the visual fixation area. So, my uh, uh, VWFA processes this printed word irrespective of which side of the fixation area this is. It also detects identity of printed words regardless of the case. So, whether it is in upper case or in lower case, it identifies both as the two different manifestation of the same letter, same sound or whatever the case may be. So, the case is not a problem, problematic case in this case or the font, whichever font are the printed words are written in, it understands perfectly. This area has also been found to be uh, found to respond to more to printed words than to spoken words. So, this is basically that is why it is visual word form uh, area. Response similarly to various different types of familiar scripts, whether it is alphabetic, it is syllabic or any other kinds of uh, script. So, it, it is it also responds similarly to different types of scripts. It responds more to printed words than any other visually ob, uh, presented objects and then so, these are some of the areas, but there are many other may, uh, some of the functions there are many other functions also. In fact, there is a, a lot of um, uh, empirical evidence a lot of work that has been that are still going on as to find out to find out what are the different functions of this area, but these are the primarily uh, the most important ones. As a result of which if this particular area gets damaged there will be a disorder which is called alexia. Alexia basically is the disability 
uh, to read printed words or letters. There are different levels of alexia of course, there are various uh, different types, um, but roughly the any, any damage to this uh, visual word from area will result in this. So, there is a correlation between this. So, we can see that reading happens actually there is a particular area in the brain that is dedicated to various aspects of reading. So, which uh, again uh, AI has not come anywhere closer to this till now. Then let us go on to the um, writing. Writing research reading on the one hand when though we have a huge there is a wealth of uh, data wealth of um, empirical evidence in case of reading research with respect to neurological uh, findings, neurological underpinnings, writing research is comparatively um, uh, less investigated, it is a less, uh, less studied area. However, we still uh, do have a lot of information even here. So, when asked to write real words, the brain uses either a phoneme graphing pathway or a route that includes the phonological, orthographic lexicon as well as semantic system. So, there are various models given for this as well. So, there are various pathways in the brain that have been found to be utilized while writing. So, one can be a phoneme graphing pathway, another is a uh, more, uh, uh, more uh, core route that is that includes the phonological orthographic lexicon and then the semantic because we need all the information in order to be able to write. So, uh, which pathway it will take uh, the writing process will take depends on whether it is regular versus irregular spelling patterns. So, irregular spelling patterns are like something like shelf. So, you write as you speak that is regular and but here we write this D S P or T, but the T is silent and so on. So, there are these are called irregular uh, spelling patterns. So, depending on the kind of spelling pattern, then the kind of length of the word, complexity and various other um, aspects of writing has been found to be processed slightly differently within the network. So, there is a different pathway for the uh, slightly different pathway for different kinds of processing in terms of writing as well. Disturbance to any of these roots will result again in another kind of disorder which is called dysgraphia. Dysgraphia is uh, inability to write, uh, write properly. So, uh, neural correlates are again again referred to uh, the VWFA. In fact, VWFA is, uh, is um, uh, proving to be an extremely important uh, brain region with respect to writing and uh, reading as well as writing and it we are st we still do not know what all it uh, is capable of doing more. So, it is the, uh, the work is still going on. So, it is uh, in case of writing also neural correlates to go and take us to the VWFA as well as some other regions like the left inferior frontal cortex. So, we have seen that with this uh, brief um, overview of the various kinds of language functions either in terms of both the disorders of language as well as normal language functions in speaking, listening that is speech production and speech perception and as well as reading and writing all these aspects of language has their own neural underpinning, neural substrates that are responsible. So, that there puts it firmly in place the idea that language research um, that uh, all kinds of language functions, all, all types of language functions are whether in the domain of la learning or processing or disorder, they do take us back to the neural substrates. So, there is a very deep connection, very close connection between language and the human brain. These are the references, uh, some of these are uh, this is uh, this is a book, but uh, uh, so is this. In um, the this is one of the most important. Then again, this uh, this is the paper on in which Paradis has uh, referred to various types of bilingual aphasics, and of course, um, this is where the model uh, Cohen has Cohen et al have given the uh, model about the visual word form area. So, very important uh, papers. So, this takes us to the end of module 6. Thank you.